Uh, it's time for a storage server video update. Storage server video, it's well, kind of a refresh. You guys might remember when we first started level one, we built our own storage server out of some repurposed storage. That thing is still humming along great. So great, in fact, that I think it's time we build another one, but not for us. This is a little bit of an experiment, a little bit of a how-to, a little bit of lessons learned. Let's take a look. So this time around, we're doing something a little different with the hardware. We get the same LSI disk shelf. We've swapped the IOM3 modules for IOM6 modules because the IOM6 modules support larger disks a little better. And we're also testing what disks are compatible with this. Now, at the time of this video, these Toshiba drives, these eight terabyte Toshiba drives, these, this specific model are compatible, as well as the WD Red NAS drives are fully compatible with the IOM uh, disk shelf. And the reason for that is because even though these disks are 4K, they'll still optionally report 512 byte sectors. This is kind of important because we're using older serial attached SCSI SAS hardware and some of the older SAS hardware has trouble with 4K sectors on the disk. So what this shelf does is it gives us two controllers and each of those controllers basically has an in and out so you can stack these disk shelves and you can have an active active configuration where you've got two physical controllers connected to every drive and you can split the load among all the drives. Mechanical drives, at the end of the day, really not that fast. You can expect a single mechanical drive to perform around 100 megabytes per second, maybe 150 megabytes per second, 200 megabytes per second at the very top end, but only for the very first part of the disk. As your, your read write head moves to the inside of the disk, the read write head is passing under less surface area of the disk per rotation, ergo the drive has to slow down. Uh, there's not as much surface area passing under the head, there's not as much data passing under the head. So we're looking at about 100 megabytes per second per spindle. So setting this up, we want to build an inexpensive storage array from just one shelf that uses as few disks as possible, but that will let us achieve basically 10 gigabit ethernet saturation. So what are we using for the host PC? Well, let's take a look. This is our Fractal Meshify C. It's a great case, it breathes really well. The componentry in here is gonna run super hot. That SAS controller, the 10 gigabit ethernet controller, if we have to have two SAS controllers, the Optane, all of these drives or all of these components are gonna run super, super hot. So we want tons of airflow. We've got an ASRock Tai Chi with a Ryzen 1800X CPU. We've also got 32 gigabytes, two 16 gig sticks of error correcting memory. This is gonna be kind of important for ZFS, but it's not the end of the world if you run the system without error correcting memory. We've also got our Optane. This is a two and a half inch version of the Intel Optane. It comes with an M.2 adapter. It's sort of like a, a ghetto fabulous M.2 to U.2 adapter because the drive itself is U.2, but the cable doesn't really go from U.2 on the drive to U.2 the square connector, it just goes straight to M.2. So it's, it's a little unusual in that the in, Intel saved the extra penny or two not having an actual U.2 connector. Most of the other bundled kits that I've seen are a standard U.2 connector on an M.2 board and then they give you a U.2 cable, but hey, who am I to question a $500, 280 gig storage drive, right? I mean, and you know, Intel knows best. The reason we're using Optane is because of its ridiculous endurance and extremely low latency. Unlike NAND Flash, uh, this drive can be rewritten on the order of tens of petabytes. And I'm not really sure that I trust NAND Flash, which is what most solid state drives are made out of, to last that long. Also, the access time and IO latency on Optane is actually genuinely better. There are two other alternative Optane devices you could have used other than a 900p. The 800p and then the original 16 and 32 gig Optanes. These are garbage, don't even bother. They're too slow and they're not really built for it and they're PCI Express by two. Even if you were to take like the ASRock four channel card that we have and put four M.2s on it, that might work if you use the 800Ps, but the smaller ones, you can forget it. It's just not worth the headache. You pretty much have to go with the 900P. Now we are splitting the 900P into partitions. So we've got a partition for our separate log, our, our separate ZFS intent log and also the L2 arc. I'm not sure if 32 gigabytes of memory is gonna be enough for the system. The old rule is that you have one gigabyte of memory per one terabyte of disk space. And depending on if we add 12 or 24 eight terabyte Toshiba disks, 
you know, we may be looking at 40 or 80 gigabytes of usable storage online because we're gonna go with the mirrored configuration. We're not gonna use RAID Z because we want maximum performance, maximum IOPS, and uh, maximum redundancy. And that's about the only way you can get that out of uh, spinning rust. So there you go. Now in terms of our disk layout and the performance and you know, is it a best practice to have your L2 ARC and your ZIL on the same device? No, that's, that's not a best practice. In an ideal world, you might actually have two of these and do a mirrored configuration. The problem you're gonna run into on the Ryzen 1800X is that there's not really enough PCI Express lanes for us to be able to do all of that. We're pushing it as is right now because we might have two SAS controllers plus our 10 gigabit ethernet adapter coming off the chipset because that's gonna be about two gigabytes per second. That's pushing, getting to where we're pushing the limits of what the chipset is capable of. And uh, I think you'd ha probably have to trade up to the, the 1900X Threadripper or something like that uh, to move up to get your extra PCI Express lanes and connectivity. Strictly speaking, we don't need the cores. In fact, a lot of stuff, especially the primitive Windows file sharing, not really multi-threaded as it turns out. So you really want the high clock speed. Even an Intel 8700K would be a, a really good choice because the super high clock speed means that you're not gonna have to fool with things like jumbo ethernet frames or anything like that, any of the old tricks that were necessary uh, to get the high throughput on 10 gigabit ethernet networks without having to have a super insanely fast CPU. So now switching gears for a second, the storage server that we use here at level one, we are using ZFS. Uh, a ZFS file system. We're using uh, like a bunch of RAID Z uh, pools, so we're not even using a mirrored configuration. We've got a bunch of uh, RAID Z2 pools, so we can lose two disks from each VDEV. There's, there's, I think there's four disks of redundancy per shelf or something like that is where we ended up. And so we've got so many disk shelves, saturating that 10 gig ethernet is absolutely no problem for our server. In terms of what it does for us, uh, it does a lot of stuff, more than just storage. We actually can automatically transcode our video uh, into proxies. We can use FFmpeg for that and Caden Live. We're using uh, Fedora Linux on the host, even though we're using ZFS. It started out as free, free NAS, but then we switched to FreeBSD and then we switched to Fedora so that we could get a little bit better multimedia functionality from Caden Live and some of the other stuff that we're doing as far as transcoding goes. We're also running Docker on the host. Docker is a sort of an automation platform, quasi containerization virtualization platform. And we're using Docker to automate things like our own Steam cache. So if we were gonna have a LAN party, we could wheel this thing to the LAN party and have a cache of all the games that we've downloaded from Steam. So uh, it's really nice to be able to download old favorites like GTA and Divinity Original Sin 2 and you know games like that at basically wire speed. I mean, we can download from our Steam cache for the machines that we have in the office that are a 10 gigabit connection. We can download from Steam at 10 gigabits, even though our internet connection is nowhere near that fast. Uh, for everybody else in the office that's on gigabit, you download at full gigabit speeds, it's absolutely no problem. Let me tell you, it is great when you're setting up a new machine and you just need to click a few buttons and install some stuff, you're good to go. You don't even have to bother with importing a Steam library off the network or anything like that. You can just let Steam do its thing and Steam just transparently will pull from the cache. We've also got that set up for Blizzard games and Origin games, although it can be a little temperamental. How you do that, how well, the devil's in the details. You're gonna need some DNS hacks and some other stuff. We could probably do that as a separate video, but I think that might be better suited to a guide on the level one forum. So I think look for that at the forum, at uh, forum.level1text.com. And then maybe if we get enough interest in it, in the forum, we could do a video or something like that. But I really want to dot my I's across my T's because we get a lot of newbies doing those tutorials and then they're like, I'm completely lost. And it's like, well, we really got to go step by step on those. Not a bad thing, just something that takes a lot of time. Now for this storage server, I don't think it's really necessary to set up Fedora or anything like that. In fact, we're just using FreeNAS for testing. And I start the testing by creating a 12 drive uh, mirrored configuration so that we've got basically 12 mirrors added to our Z pool. And uh, right now I'm using two terabyte disks because our eight terabyte disks are not in, in yet. I do have a Toshiba eight terabyte disk and a WD Red eight terabyte disk that I can use for testing just to be sure that those work. But in terms of does this actually saturate speed and things like that in sort of this worst case scenario, yes it does. Even before we add the Optane, even bef before we add the, the ZIL on a separate device, we're already uh, right up against the, the bandwidth limits of 10 gig ethernet. We're doing on an uncompressed workload uh, to our ZFS data set, we're doing 800 to 1100 megabytes per second. 
So why would we add the ZIL and why would we add the L2 arc? Well, we may not need to. I mean, it sort of goes against conventional wisdom, but ZFS, modern ZFS, in some situations, you can get away with less memory usage than one gigabyte per terabyte. In modern use cases, in modern scenarios, especially when we're talking about storing big video files and the type of workload that we have on our ZFS storage server, you can get into other scenarios where it doesn't quite work as well. Um, by default, there's another thing called a shift, like the, the how, and it has to do with the relationship of the physical sector size, which in this case is 4K. What is reported by the drives is 512 bytes, but I'm happy to report that FreeBSD, FreeNAS automatically figures out a shift now and it figured it out correctly for this pool. There are a lot of other uh, ZFS and FreeBSD tunables that you can apply to the system that can speed it up, but unless you know what you're doing, you can actually make things a lot worse. Now in terms of us adding the separate log device, we're gonna go ahead and do that. We're gonna create a 60 gigabyte partition, which is probably too large, and go ahead and add that here. Now why 60 gigabytes? Well, uh, because we're mostly gonna be writing large video files to this thing by default, uh, ZFS or the, you know, the, the mechanism here will keep about five seconds worth of data in memory before it, it sort of blocks new data and says, okay, I need to get this data written out to disk before I accept new data. For our workload, adjusting it to 30 seconds has had no ill effects and that helps us when we're dumping memory cards and things like that, it will keep things running a little smoother. So we're gonna adjust the, the parameters on the ZFS pool so that we can write to it for about 30 seconds. With the uh, Optane, we can write it all to Optane in that 30 seconds and then if the power goes out or something bad happens or whatever, it can be read from the Optane device and written to the mechanical disks for about 30 seconds worth of, of stuff. So 30 seconds is 60 gigabytes enough to hold 30 seconds of information. It'd be about 30 gigabytes at one gigabyte per second. Or if we've got two 10 gig connections, it'd be about 60 gigabytes. A Little bit back of the envelope math there, but that's how I came up with 60 gigabytes. Also, we're doing something called over-provisioning. So we're creating some partitions on Optane. We're not really using the whole drive. And the, the good news is that the firmware on Optane will distribute those writes across the whole disk automatically, so we'll get even wearing. Uh, for the other partition, we're using an L2 arc, a layer two advanced replacement cache. And so this is like a read cache for your ZFS pool. We're gonna create that one at 100 gigabytes. That gives us roughly 100 gigabytes of unused space on our Optane, but it's automatically gonna distribute the writes that go to Optane across all of the space on the device because the firmware is smart. It knows what, what areas of the disk you're using and what areas of the disk that you're not using. And in that, we actually increase the endurance of our disk. Some people have been using NAND flash SSDs for their ZIL or their L2 arc using the same over provisioning strategy. We did that ourselves on the level one storage server uh, using a 450 gig Intel 750. The Intel 750 SSD is NAND flash, but that thing is built like a tank. And we're using about 100 gigabytes of the 450 gigabytes and monitoring it using the utilities. We can see that it is doing the wire leveling thing and, and basically everything works with that. And it's showing no signs of wearing out or, or having any problems. But again, that's because of our specific workload and we understand how the technology works. Your mileage may vary. Now, something I'll mention really quickly you may not even really need an Optane cache. The only thing that the cache, the write cache, the separate intent log, the ZIL, you know, ZFS intent log being on a separate device, really matters for is synchronous writes. That is when something asks for something to be written immediately. You see this with virtual machine type workloads. Don't really see this on most normal NAS type workloads where you're just copying a bunch of files to it. So you may not even really need the cache. Now, because we've only got 32 gigabytes of memory in this system, I may need to go to 64 depending on the pool size, but using Optane for the uh, layer two arc, the L2 arc, maybe makes sense because you know 280 gigabytes of Optane is gonna be less than DDR4, shockingly. Although even 280 gigabytes is a little bit overkill. The Optane 800P really would be a good choice if it wasn't so damn slow on the writes. The reason for that, the way ZFS works is, hopefully this write cache is written to, but never read. The only time it would ever be read is in the case of like recovering from a bad situation or recovering from a situation where something happened unexpectedly, like a power failure or some other kind of event that shut the whole thing down. And then it will read from the intent log and reconstruct what was supposed to happen on disk. 
if you're used to like battery backed RAID controllers and you're getting your right cache, this is kind of sort of what the battery backed cache does for you, except you know, this will store its data pretty much indefinitely. Actually, it's a funny story. If you have an Optane drive that's off for a long time, as soon as you turn it on, it'll immediately rewrite itself. It's a quirk of the, uh, a quirk of the hardware because it's worried that it actually would lose data integrity if it's off and unplugged for a long time. But most people don't realize that. So it's fine. We'll just pretend that doesn't happen. So that's pretty much the long and short of it. That's what goes into picking out these parts. We've got a little bit of old world technology and a little bit of new world technology. And really the bulk of our expense here is our eight terabyte disks for the disk shelf and everything else. Everything else, it's just, you know, a few hundred dollars worth of equipment. Five, 10 years ago, buying this kind of a setup in the enterprise would be north of $100,000, probably more like $200,000, give or take. Uh, is the enterprise solution more bulletproof and robust? Yes, absolutely. But the magic here really is ZFS. And I know there are other file systems like ButterFS or BTRFS and lots of other replication technologies and things like that. ZFS is so far and away, so advanced and so reliable that I would, I would rather be running ZFS on hardware like this than something that's not ZFS on proprietary enterprise gear that, that may or may not die in a way that I understand. And that's just because I understand how ZFS works internally and ZFS has always done everything that I've asked of it. So ZFS is a really incredible file system. It does come with a lot of overhead. I mean, we're, we're running an eight core system here with 32 gigs of ECC memory. That's gonna be better than a lot of systems you guys are running at home for your primary computers. But for the type of data that it's storing, business data, this is sort of the minimum that you need to be able to do that. We also need to set up some stuff on the storage server, like if you lose a disk, it sends an email so that you can get a replacement disk. Might not be a bad idea to add some spare disks because if one of these disks dies, it's nice to add the replacement disk while keeping the disk that died still plugged into the system. But we're not gonna be able to do that if all 24 slots are occupied. So there are some trade-offs. If you're thinking about building a storage server like this or you've already built one and you wanna show off, come and add some pictures to the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.